Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's presentation. Uh, once again, it's great to have you with us, and it's wonderful to see so many familiar names again joining us this evening. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, tonight's presentation, we're really, really lucky. Um, we've got Dan Free, uh, a true Ethiopian expert, talking to us this evening. Uh, and he's going to be talking about the areas of Ethiopia that we offer uh, in, um, in the range of the trips that we run there through Wildlife Worldwide and also the Travelling Naturalist. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Dan and don't know who he is, uh, then shame on you. But I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, uh, do know Dan. Uh, Dan Free, he's our manager for Wildlife Worldwide and the Travelling Naturalist. Uh, he is the brains behind all of the product that you see on our website. Uh, it is uh, entirely down to him and uh, the wonderful team that he has working with him that uh, we're able to produce such great tra uh, travelling opportunities and that we, you know, we uh, send out to you on our e-newses and that you'll see on our website. And Ethiopia, I know, is a destination very close to Dan's heart. And um, he's been really looking forward to sharing some of the passion that he has for the country with you all this evening. So hello, Dan. Evening, Nick. Evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> um, so look, um, just before we um, let Dan um, get into his stride with the presentation, there's just a couple of things that I want to um, alert you all to. Um, and I'm sure that this that you're familiar with with Zoom webinars by now, but um, do please submit your questions to us throughout the presentation, okay? Uh, and we'll come to those right at the end. So once Dan has completed his presentation, um, I'll do my very best to get through as many of the questions that you have submitted to us throughout the presentation. And you can submit them um, using two functions in the webinar. Um, if you're looking at this on a PC, which I am, you'll see that if you hover your mouse towards the bottom of the screen, a little toolbar will pop up and you've got a Q&A button. Uh, and so you can, you can submit your questions through that function or you can submit them to us using the chat function, which is also there in the toolbar. I think if you're looking at this on a tablet, that toolbar appears at the top of the screen. Either way, I'm sure you can work it out. Uh, and as I say, we will um, get through as many of those questions uh, as possible at the end uh, of the presentation. And we'll have a question that we want to ask you as well. Uh, and we'll do that at the end of the presentation too. So um, otherwise, I'm going to uh, hand over to our leader for this evening's trip, who will be guiding us through uh, the wonderful country, which is Ethiopia. And I have to say, Dan, on a personal note, I've been particularly looking forward to this presentation because you probably don't know that um, Ethiopia is one of the destinations that I've never traveled to and I have always wanted to travel to even before uh, Namibia which I'm sure that many of you know is a, is a country close to my heart and the reason that um, I uh, am so interested um, to go to Ethiopia is not just because of the wildlife which I know that you're going to be talking about but it's also its cultural heritage, which is something that um, I'm fascinated by. Because I remember when I was quite young, I was reading a, um, a National Geographic magazine and it was talking about the rock hewn churches in Lalabella and uh, Aksum, where you know, supposedly the Ark of the Covenant has been laid to rest. Uh, and Queen of Sheba brought these incredible uh, uh, obelisks into Ethiopia as well in, and the fortified castles. So there's whole lot to see in Ethiopia that besides the wildlife that I'm also interested to see as well but I'm particularly keen to uh, hear um, more about the wildlife viewing opportunities there as well. So Dan I'm going to hand over to you okay uh, and um, uh, yeah we'll uh, talk again when you've said everything that you need to say. Good man. Thank you Nick. Lovely. Well, yeah, just to reiterate, thank you guys for, for joining us this evening. Um, it is massively appreciated. Um, and I have the, the privilege and, and the honour to be talking about Ethiopia. Uh, and it is a country that is very dear to my heart. Um, and it was, in fact, the first country that I travelled to when I joined the wildlife travel industry about 10 years ago. And I have to admit that when I first found out that I was going to be travelling to Ethiopia, I was uh, a little bit apprehensive. Um, I'd grown up at a time 
when all I knew of Ethiopia, sadly, was of, of the terrible drought and the famine. Um, and then this was made even probably worse by, by the fact that when I started my role, um, my predecessor of, of, well, he'd been in the role for about 20 years, his first piece of advice he gave me when handing over the, the various trips and stuff was that Ethiopia was a, an absolute nightmare of a country to manage. And should anybody inquire about it, I should try and persuade them to travel elsewhere. So it was with kind of real mixed emotions that I set off on a, on a three week trip to Ethiopia uh, with my wife and, and six clients. And I have to admit that I was absolutely blown away by the country. Um, it was nothing like I expected. Um, the wildlife was incredible. The, the people were absolutely fabulous. And, and some of the scenery was just breathtaking. Now, over the course of the next 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to run through a series of slides and hopefully give you a flavour of what you can expect from a visit to Ethiopia. Um, most of the photos were taken by my wife and some of those other ones are, that we'll be using have been taken by tour leaders and also by clients. So it should be a, a very kind of accurate uh, representation of what you can expect from a visit. Um, before we get started, I th think it's worth kind of just considering a, a few facts and figures about the country. And obviously it, it's a landlocked country um, in the Horn of Africa. It's uh, got Eritrea to the north, uh, Somalia to the east, Kenya to the south, and Sudan to the west. So it's fair to say that it's got some interesting neighbours, but despite this, it's actually a, a very safe place to visit. And in my 10 years of, of running trips to Ethiopia, I've not encountered any problems uh, with, with my guests travelling and with safety issues or anything like that. It, it really is a, a super place to visit in that regard. I mean, it is also a very big country. Uh, we're looking at around a million square kilometres. So that's roughly the size of France and Spain combined. And perhaps most significantly, it is dominated by a vast central highland area, which actually occupies about 50% of the country. Uh, it has an average altitude of around 2000 metres and it's bisected by the Rift Valley, which runs through here. Now, climatically, it varies enormously as well. Um, you've got periodic snowfall up in the highlands, and then as you descend into the lowlands, uh, particularly along this eastern uh, border here, you can be looking at temperatures of in excess of 50 degrees. Uh, from a population perspective, the last census in 2019 put the population at around 109 million, um, which given the, the size of the country is not actually that densely populated. Now, in terms of wildlife, uh, it has got some super species, both um, birds and, and mammals. Um, over 800 species of bird have been recorded. Um, many of these are endemic to Ethiopia, which means that they're only found in Ethiopia, or they're near endemic, which means that they're either found in Ethiopia or in one or two of the neighboring countries. And there's about 30 endemic slash kind of near endemic bird species. There's also around 250 species of mammal, which as a mammal list is not actually that high compared to the likes of Kenya or Tanzania, but crucially it includes some really very special species, some, some icons of Ethiopia that are found nowhere else in the world, some endemic mammals uh, that we'll be looking at first up. Now, this evening, I'm gonna be talking through four key kind of wildlife destinations. So we're gonna start off up in the Simeon Mountains, which is just up here. And then we're gonna come down to Awash National Park, which is just to the east of the capital, Addis Ababa. We're then gonna go down to the Rift Valley, uh, to the lakes down there. And then we're gonna finish up in the Bali Mountains. Now to get to Ethiopia, you can fly with KLM or something like that via Amsterdam, but the easiest way is just to, to fly with Ethiopian Airlines. They're the only ones providing a direct route. Um, and it's usually an overnight flight from London Heathrow that gets into Addis the following morning. Now, on some of our itineraries, we then kick on and go straight on to one of these destinations, which I've mentioned. Um, in other instances, we'll actually spend the day in Addis. And there's some good stuff to be done in Addis. There's a, a fantastic museum. Um, there's some good birding just on the outskirts. So it really depends what you want to do. Now, this evening we are going to kick off in the Simeons, and the gateway to the Simeons is Gonda, and that's about an hour's flight north of Addis, and from there it's about a three hour drive to get up into the National Park. And this is what you can expect from the Simeons, this kind of view here. Uh, it is absolutely breathtaking scenery. 
Uh, we're looking at one of Africa's largest mountain ranges, and it's got multiple peaks over 4,000 metres, the highest of which is Mount Rashdashan at 4,620 metres. Now this view here gives you a sense of the, uh, of the flora of the simians. And the simians consist of several major plateaux and they're divided by large river valleys and they play host to not only some fascinating flora with huge kind of hillsides of dense moss covered juniper and hygiena forests and open grasslands punctuated by uh, fabulous giant lobelias like we can see on the left here and even stands of red hot pokers on the right here. Um, but this flora and this landscape supports three absolutely fantastic mammal species, um, all endemic to Ethiopia and icons of the country. The first of these and perhaps the most common is the gelard baboon and the simians is a stronghold for the species with a population of around 7,000 individuals. Now they're found throughout Ethiopia, or well, throughout the highlands in Ethiopia I should say, and the total population is around to be, or is thought to be around 250,000. Um, they're usually found in family groups of around 30 individuals, and these family groups will comprise of um, smaller subgroups of a dominant male and then half a dozen females and then some youngsters. But what often happens is these groups of 30 or so individuals will come together um, into what is known as, as a mega herd and you can have two, three, maybe even 400 animals all in one place. Um, this photo here was taken on my first evening in the Simians. We'd just arrived and the sun was just starting to go down and these baboons were all gathering at the edge of the plateau. Um, they'd been up on the plateau feeding on the grasses. They're a strictly herbivorous species, but they retreat to the edge of the cliffs uh, at night, just for safety really, just to avoid any potential predators. Um, there's spotted hyenas, there's leopards in the area. So they all gather here before retreating down the cliffs and it's a lovely time just to see them in some fabulous light and they are just the most superb species to, to spend time with. Um, baboons often have a bit of a bad reputation in Africa but these guys are the, the polar opposite of, of, of a lot of those kind of bad baboons. Um, they are very tolerant of us, they will sit or allow you to sit in amongst them and just observe them and they're very intelligent individuals. They have a, a very complex uh, vocal system. So they're sitting there and they're constantly chatting away and being strictly herbivorous, they're, they're just plucking away at the grass um, and then just eating leaves one by one. Um, and when you've got two or 300 animals doing this, the, 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 the sound is, is incredible. You can hear that the plucking, and I won't try and replicate it because I'll just make a fool of myself, but it, there's something just really special about it. And they're, they're chattering away just in a, quite a soft voice um, and, and you can just spend hours with these animals. They really are very special. It, it really is the most spectacular uh, setting to, to observe these animals. And they are impressive you know, animals in themselves, the males particularly so. Uh, they've got a thick golden mane. Um, they've got piercing orange eyes. This photo on the left here, which I absolutely love. My wife took that one. Um, and then they've got a, a distinctive uh, red heart-shaped patch on their chest. And this is believed to serve the same purpose that the colorful buttocks and, and brightly colored testicles uh, found on other primates in Africa. Um, it, it's a, a reproductive kind of communicative system. Um, they're, they're large animals, they, they can weigh nearly 20 kgs. Uh, the males, the females are around 11 or 12. Um, but they are, as I say, they're very tolerant of us and we can just sit there and enjoy spending um, some quality time with them. Um, the males, they, they will occasionally bicker um, they, they do try and avoid fighting, uh, obviously, and if they are feeling agitated by another male, um, then they will display uh, their canines. And their canines, as you can see, are, are really quite impressive. They're said to be larger than that of a lion. Now, the second of Ethiopia's endemic mammals that we hope to see up in the simians is the Wallyer ibex, and it's widely considered to be Ethiopia's rarest endemic mammal, uh, with a population of around 400 individuals. Uh, they are classed as endangered on the IECN. Uh, red list. Now both the males and the females grow horns but the males grow particularly large horns and they can measure over a meter in length. Um, now despite being very rare they can be seen quite reliably in an area called Chenuk and to get to Chenuk we'd probably drive out from our lodge which we'll have a look at later um, and it's a, a, an hour or so drive and we'll stop frequently along the way um, and then you'll get there and then you can explore on foot and in the Simmons you are 
well, you're up at around 4,000 meters. So it is quite a high altitude and you do need to take things slow, but you can get some incredible sightings of these Waller Ibex, particularly if some of the males are sparring. And it's not unusual for them to be seen alongside the geladas here. On this slide, we can just see uh, some geladas in the background. Now, ecologists in the area have calculated the carrying capacity of the simians alone um, should be around 3,000 animals. So there's still plenty of scope for that population to increase further. So um, with, with a bit of luck, that will continue to grow. Now, the third of Ethiopia's endemic mammals that we can hope to see in the simians is um, the Ethiopian wolf. And this is, is a, a slightly sadder tale in the sense that um, the simians used to be a stronghold for the Ethiopian wolf. Uh, there used to be a population of over 200 Sadly, due to uh, a rabies epidemic uh, a few years back, the population crashed from, as I say, about 200 down to 40 individuals. And these days, you do have to be quite lucky to, to see wolves up in the simians. They are gradually making a comeback, um, but it's, it's slow progress. And we've had a handful of guests see the, the wolves up there. But if I'm honest, if you really want to see the wolves, your best bet is probably to go to um, the Bali Mountains, which is a, a de destination that we'll consider in a little bit. Now, there is also some fabulous bird life to be seen up in the simians. They're not really known for, the, for their birds, uh, the simians, but there's around 180 species that have been recorded. And there's some real highlights in there. You've got lammergeiers kind of soar, whilst well, just soaring overhead, or indeed, if you're up at around 4,000 meters on the escarpment, they'll just be going level with you. Um, and they're often seen alongside Lana falcon and auger buzzard, pallid harrier, red-breasted sparrowhawk, and also tawny eagles, uh, which we've got on the left here. On the right, we've got a thick-billed raven, and it's an endemic to Ethiopia. Um, it's only found in Ethiopia, and it's a, a cracking species, a, a very characterful species. If you stop for a, a picnic at all, um, the likelihood is that the ravens will fly in and try and steal your sandwiches and stuff. Um, interestingly, when I visited Ethiopia the first time, uh, we camped up in the Simians, uh, and we trekked for for three nights and uh, the guys would kind of put um, some soap and some water outside our tents in the morning and every morning we'd come out there wasn't actually soap there um, and we didn't know what was going on until the final morning we realized that the ravens were stealing the soap and then flying off with it and eating it. Um, you wouldn't think it'd be that tasty but they seemed to enjoy it. Now as I mentioned that there is a, a couple of lodges in fact uh, available up in the Simians now. Uh, Simian Lodge is the one that we tend to use because it's actually based in the National Park but there is another one called Limneo uh, which is just outside the park which is also very comfortable. Simian Lodge it's not fancy but it's perfectly um, decent for, for a few nights. Um, the rooms are all en suites and uh, it's obviously quite cold at this altitude so the guys will provide hot water bottles in the dining area, they'll, they'll light a fire and it's a lovely place to stay and having camped up there I can strongly recommend the lodge over that any day of the week. Now I, I did mention it earlier but to get up to the Simians um, you'll likely need to go through Gonda, um, that, that's kind of the gateway for the national park. And it's a very nice place just to spend uh, a night or two, either at the start of the trip or at the end of the trip uh, into the Simians. Um, it's the former capital of Ethiopia. So there's a series of castles there that were built by King Vasilidas in the 17th century. Uh, they're well worth a, a look around and there's often some good birds to be seen there. You've got greyish eagle owls and uh, red-eyed dove uh, amongst many other species. And it's also an opportunity just to acclimatise a little bit more and get used to that higher altitude. The photos on the left here, we've got a common crane and then up in the top left hand corner, that was the, the minibus on my first trip. And we pulled up in an area called the Fogra Plains, which is just to the south of Gonda, uh, just to the east of Lake Tana. And uh, we, we didn't think that there was anybody around for miles, but um, within about two minutes of getting out of the vehicle and setting up the scopes and, and having a scan, just about 20 people just emerged out of the fields and all came over for a chat. And they were all very welcoming and, and very chatty, but it seemed to be a bit of a, a running theme in Ethiopia. That you could think that you're the, in the most remote place going and then somebody would just spring up from somewhere and come over for a chat. If you are visiting in, in October, November time, um, then you've got a good chance of seeing these cranes out on the Fogra Plains and they will be literally arriving in their thousands. So it's quite a spectacle. Now that is 
the, the Simeons, and that is Gonda. Um, we, we're just going to have a very quick look at a place called Lalabella, um, which is just to the east of Gonda. It's just over here. Um, and Gonda is, is probably Ethiopia's most famous historical site. It's very easy just to tuck in a couple of days to your itinerary and visit Lalibela um, from Gonda. And uh, we, we do this on a, a lot of our itineraries. It's, it's one of the um, wonders of the world. It's a UNESCO site. And it's all about these medieval churches that were carved out of the bedrock uh, back in the 12th century uh, by King Lalibela. Um, his idea was to create a new Jerusalem um, and it, it's a, a remarkable place to visit. The, the churches are, are all carved out of this bedrock and uh, it, it's not like anywhere I've ever seen previously. Uh, it's, it's breathtaking and we do a, a few photographic trips here each year and um, there's, there's some incredible imagery to be got. Uh, this is a photo which Ben Cherry, one of our tour leaders, took a couple of years ago. Um, we'll either get there in the early morning light or in the late afternoon light so that we get the light coming through like this and it makes for uh, some really atmospheric photography. Now we would normally, after visiting Lalibela, return back to Addis and then head out from there. And the, the easiest uh, or, or the closest national park to speak of to Addis is, is really Arash National Park, which is around 200 kilometres to the east of Addis. And in stark contrast to the Simeons, um, what we're looking at here is an area of open grassland and acacia scrub. Um, it's around 750 square kilometers and it was set up in the 1960s. Um, it's very well known for its bird life. Over 450 species have been recorded and it's also got a good range of mammals, but they're in much lower densities than what you might expect, for example, in somewhere like Kenya or Tanzania. Uh, but it's because of this low density and specifically the low predator density that means that you can explore on foot. So generally, if you're visiting Arash, you'll, you'll be going out on foot, you'll be driving and then walking and seeing what you bump into. Some of the mammal species you're likely to encounter include uh, salt stick dick, uh, which is a, an endemic to the Horn of Africa. It's this little chap just on the left here. And also Somring's gazelle. Uh, they're often seen out on the plains alongside Bicer oryx. Uh, this is a, a flagship species for the park really, and they're usually to be found in good numbers. In the drier kind of scrubbier areas, you've got lesser kudu. Um, in some of the wetter areas, there are some lakes, there's some rivers, you might find greater kudu as well. And then as you might expect, the, the park has a, a population of olive baboons, uh, which are found pretty much all over the park. But there is also a population of what's known as Hamadryas baboons. Um, they're more lightly built uh, than the olives, um, and they tend to be found up in the north of the park uh, in a rocky area. Um, and whilst with the geladas, it's, um, it's fair to say that they're quite a nice species, shall we say, and, and, and quite pleasant. Um, the males, they, they look after their females. They keep their harems together by grooming the females, by protecting them. This is the, the polar opposite to the, the Hamadryas baboons, um, where they operate what's known as a patriarchal system. Um, and that essentially means that the males will, will bully the females into staying with them. Uh, it's a unique um, society in, in amongst the baboons and the macaques. Um, and th they're really not particularly pleasant animals, should we say. Um, they will bite the females um, and pull them back into place if they try and you know, wander away at all. Um, they're often involved in fights with other males. They'll take youngsters hostage. Um, so they're, they're, I mean, it's a fascinating kind of social dynamics, but uh, just the, the polar opposite to, to what you will have seen with the geladas. As the males grow older, uh, the fur turns lighter and lighter. And I always think that they, they look a little bit like crazy scientists. Uh, if you look at this chap at the back here in particular with this brushy fur out the sides, um, always kind of makes me chuckle. Uh, another kind of highlight of visiting, visiting Arash National Park is a, a visit to the hyena caves. Uh, again, this is up in the north of the park and you'll usually uh, arrive there in the late afternoon, early evening, and then go and sit maybe 30, 40 meters away from the entrance to a cave and then just wait for dusk to fall. And as the light begins to fade, um, hyenas will, will often start to emerge. Uh, when we were there, I think we had about eight come out, um, but I have had clients that have seen up to 30 emerge from this one cave. And they'll kind of trot out and, and wander over to you and stop, you know, maybe 10 metres away, have a sniff of the air and have a look at you and 
realize that you're not particularly interesting and then go about on their nightly duties. But it certainly gets the adrenaline going, uh, seeing these animals on foot. Um, so that, that is something which if you visit Awash, I would strongly recommend. Now, like anywhere in the world, uh, and particularly Africa, night drives can be very hit and miss. Um, sometimes you can go out and see a whole wealth of species, other times you'll go out and you'll see nothing. Uh, when we were there, we saw this African uh, civet, uh, I think we saw some genet species, um, African wildcat, and you even occasionally see aardwolf. Um, if you're late, or if you're out in the late afternoon, early evening, or, or early in the following morning, uh, then you've got a good chance of seeing bat eared foxes. But there's a whole range of, of mammals which are possible. Um, there are lions in the park, there is leopard, um, caracal is seen occasionally, but it's all very rare. So you need a, a big slice of luck to see it. But as I mentioned earlier, the, the park is probably better known for its bird life. And Yes, over 400 species, 450 species have been recorded, uh, and that includes a, a tantalizing array of raptors, of rollers, of uh, busted shrikes and, and parrots. Um, this is a, a lappet faced vulture, which we saw just circling over a bicep oryx kill. Um, and then at the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got the, the pygmy falcon, which at 20 centimeters is even smaller than our blackbird. These are often seen out in the acacia scrubland. But you're likely to see a vast array of species. You've got Abyssinian roller, um, this is red-fronted tinkerbird on the left, or sulfur-breasted trike. Um, there's seven species of busted that have been recorded in Awash. Uh, this is a cory busted that's just being trailed by northern carmine beater. Sometimes they'll even sit on the back of the cory busteds, which is quite nice. Um, Awash is one of the best places for seeing the Arabian busted as well, which is quite a, a desirable species for a lot of birders. In the acacia, again, we've got three species of wider. We've got the uh, straw, um, straw wider on the left here, a pintailed wider, and also long-tailed paradise wider. And these species are, are very interesting in the sense that they are species-specific brood parasites. Uh, so they lay their eggs in various different species of waxbill, very similar to our cuckoos over here. Um, they're, they're parasites, uh, but they've obviously got these magnificent tails, or the males have at least anyway. And, uh, they're always a, a joy to see. There is a river running through Ash, um, so you're likely to see Nile crocodiles there. And in fact, you can often see them just from the lodge. The lodge sits on the edge of the river, just on the on a gorge there. Um, and it's quite a simple setup. It's Arash Falls Lodge. Uh, the rooms, the chalets are, are all very simply done. They're all en suite, but they're perfectly comfortable. Um, and in Arash, we're looking at temperatures of probably around 30 to 35 degrees during the middle of the day. Um, it doesn't get particularly cold at night. So they're more than adequate for you know, a few nights um, in the National Park. Now, one of the highlights of visiting Arash as well is, is enjoying a, a coffee ceremony. Um, Ethiopia is reported to be the, the home of uh, coffee and uh, the ceremony involves roasting the, um, the coffee beans over a fire, boiling the water and then serving three rounds of coffee. Uh, and it's considered very rude to leave before all three rounds have been served. So. Um, it's a well worth um, exercise and, you know, it's part of a ceremony. Uh, so, so do, you know, partake in that if you visit, um, but just don't expect to sleep for about 24, 48 hours afterwards. Um, the coffee really does uh, kick in and, and have quite an impact. Now that's um, Awash National Park. Um, from there, it's not unusual to travel back west and then travel down the Rift Valley. Uh, and there's about half a dozen lakes that can be encountered here. Um, which are primarily of interest from a birding perspective. Um, the majority of the lakes lack an outlet, so they're very alkaline. Um, and subsequently, they, they don't necessarily support a huge range of species, but what species are present can be present in quite large numbers. So for example, Lake Abiata is the equivalent of uh, Kenya's Lake Nakuru. Um, and there's often huge numbers of flamingo here of both greater and lesser species. Um, I think up to 300,000 have been recorded in the past and if you're traveling in the autumn months or indeed in the spring months, early spring months, you may well see some migrant waders along the shores of Lake Aviata. Where you do get a freshwater lake then you get a profusion of life. Uh, you get uh, lots of vegetation, uh, uh, incredible variety of fish, and subsequently a huge variety of birds. And one of the joys of a visit to the Rift Valley um, in Ethiopia is 
is to visit the um, Lake Oasa and specifically the fishing market there. Uh, the fishermen bring their catches ashore. I mean, they're all fished using traditional methods, just casting nets and reeling them in. And you can go along and they'll be sorting out their catch, discarding some of their bycatch or perhaps gutting the fish and discarding some of the, the guts and so forth. And the, the birds will be waiting for them. And you get these kind of congregations of species just jostling for position, just wanting to, to get on some of these fish. Um, so you've got marabou storks and great white pelicans, sacred ibis, hammercops, all in a really tight space. And they're all very confiding. I, I don't know the reason why, but for some reason, a lot of the birds in Ethiopia just seem to be very tolerant of humans. Uh, so it does offer some remarkable photographic opportunities. Away from this hustle and bustle, just along the lake shore, you can see black herons, and they've obviously got this fabulous method of canopy feeding where they spread their wings like an umbrella. That creates a bit of shade. The fish come under to shelter from the sun, and then the bird will just dart down and snatch them out of the water. Malachite kingfishers, you seem to get these almost every five, ten meters around the edge of the lake. And again, they're really tolerant. So you can get to within two or three meters of them. This was a photo that my wife took. Um, and I think this bird, as I say, could only have been about six feet away. It was taken with a 100 to 400 lens, uh, but they're absolutely beautiful birds. Good waders, you've got um, black winged stilts. This is a marsh sandpiper, various plovers and so forth. And also these delightful little African pygmy geese, uh, which are about the size of the Eurasian teal. So they really are tiny birds. The eaters, as you might imagine, uh, are very common along the edge of the lake and even you do uh, occasionally get colobus monkeys in the stands of forest uh, around the lake as well, um, even in fact in, in the lodge grounds, um, and they can provide some super photographic opportunities. Again, they're quite tolerant of humans and they're magnificent looking animals, really, really striking. Hippos are present in Lake Oasa, um, but I would actually suggest that Lake Lingano is, is probably a better place to see them. Um, at Lake Owasi, you have to get out on a boat and can be a bit of a faff, whereas at Lake Lungano, it's just a stroll um, along the lake shore. Lake Lungano is, is an alkaline lake, um, so we haven't got the huge profusion of birds on the lake that we see at Lake Owasa. But in the surrounding habitat, there's a, there's a mosaic of uh, ancient fig forests and acacia trees and open grassland, and this supports over 400 species of birds. So it is super, super birding just along the lake shore. You've got your obvious candidates, the African fish eagles. Um, but as soon as you get into the, into the forest, you've got the likes of this near endemic white cheek turaco, um, beautiful African paradise flycatchers. Uh, we've got black billed barbet on the left here, yellow fronted parrot. Uh, it, just everywhere you turn, there's a different species. Um, this guy is, is pretty unmistakable, uh, almost prehistoric looking, and it's a silvery cheeked hornbill. Uh, and this is really your alarm clock uh, when you're in Ethiopia. Uh, I challenge you to sleep through this in the mornings. Uh, at first light they will start calling and they do not give up uh, and it's a, an incredible sound. Um, so you've just got to accept that you're going to be getting up uh, when they start calling but uh, a super bird to see. Now this isn't an image of ours, uh, this is just a stock image but it's here just to, to tell a bit of a story. Now when I was out there uh, first time around, we were birding around the edge of the lake and we saw lots of signs of aardvark, you know, burrows and digging and so forth and went back to the lodge for dinner in the evening, had a bite to eat and just thought on the off chance that we'd go out with a, a spotlight and just see if we could see anything all on foot. Um, so we walked through a patch of forest out onto an open grassland and lo and behold, the first thing that we put the spotlight on was an aardvark and it well, quickly kind of moved off and we were only able to observe it for about a minute, but this was the first time I'd seen an aardvark and I and, and the guests that I was with were absolutely over the moon. And I have had guests that have returned specifically like to Lake Ngana to try and see aardvark, um, staying for four or five nights and doing these, these night walks. Some have been successful, some haven't, but it's a, it's a fabulous animal to see if you are lucky. We are then going to move on from the Rift Valley now, and, and I'm going to take you out to the Bali Mountains, so out to the east of the Rift Valley. Uh, we've got this super, super place, which for me is the jewel in the crown for Ethiopia's wildlife, um, in, certainly in terms of destinations. Uh, it's a national park of around 2,200 square kilometres, um, again, was set aside in the 1960s. And it lies between about 2,500 and 4,500 metres but it doesn't have the, the same kind of dramatic 
scenery, which uh, the Simians does. Um, but it, what it does have is a, an incredible variety of flora and fauna. Um, the most exciting area is an area called the Sineti Plateau, which is up at around 4,000 metres. And it's an extensive area of Afro-Alpine moorlands. And it's not too dissimilar to the Scottish Highlands in appearance. Now, the Barley Mountains are home to 20 of Ethiopia's endemic mammals, and five of these species are completely unique to the Barley Mountains. Now, on top of that, there's 12 of Ethiopia's endemic amphibians found here, and then a further four of Ethiopia's endemic reptiles, and, and two of these are unique to the Barley Mountains. And it's been suggested by ecologists and scientists that such is the degree of endemism within the park that it has been calculated that more mammal species would go extinct if the habitats of the Barley Mountains were to disappear than if any other area of equivalent size on the globe were to disappear. And that really is quite a sobering thought. Um, it's such a unique habitat. And sadly, you know, as we'll see shortly, it, it is under threat from overgrazing and stuff. So we, we do really need to do everything we can to protect it. Um, and not least because it is home to around 200 individuals of Ethiopian wolves. Um, it is the most reliable place that I know to see this species. Um, the total population in Ethiopia is only believed to be around 500. They're not found anywhere else in the world. Um, but despite being the, the rarest of the world's 37 canid species, you can see them, I'm pleased to say, quite reliably in the Bali Mountains. And it's, it's back to this Seneti Plateau that I was talking about. What you need to do is drive very slowly across the plateau and just scan and look for these wolves, just drive backwards and forwards. And with a bit of luck, you'll see a wolf. They usually hunt uh, on their own or occasionally in pairs. Um, but if you do see them, they, they can often be observed on foot. Um, some can be quite tolerant, so you can observe them from 80 to 100 metres away. And they'll be going about, uh, you know, displaying a, a range of behaviours, possibly out marking their territories or indeed hunting. And the likelihood is that they're probably going to be hunting for these guys. These are giant mole rats. Uh, this is essentially a, a packed lunch for an Ethiopian wolf. Um, you'll see it's quite a blurred image, and, and that's kind of representative of the fact that they are a really difficult species to predict where they're going to pop up. They've got a network of burrows and they pop up all over the place. So trying to get a sharp image is, is not easy, but they can occur in really high densities of up to 2,600 individuals per square kilometre. And that's alongside a variety of grassland rat species as well. And that is the principal prey of the Ethiopian wolf. Now we were lucky enough to, to watch them hunting on several occasions. Um, this, this photo here just shows uh, one of the hunting methods where uh, this wolf was actually lying outside of the burrow of a giant mole rat and they saw it start to emerge and then pounced on it. Other times they will just go between burrows, put their heads or their, their muzzles down there, sniff, and if there's a mole rat down there, they will dig it out. So they all have their different methods of hunting. Uh, they're, they're not huge dog species, they're about 16 kgs, uh, the males and about 13 kgs, the females. And despite this kind of red coloured fur and misleading names like the simian fox, they are a true wolf species and phylogenetic analysis has shown that the closest kind of living relative to the Ethiopian wolf is the European grey wolf. Now if you are really lucky, uh, you may even see them with pups. Um, the, the, Wolves don't occur in, in high densities. They're, they're usually small family groups. It's not unusual just to have, some, well, just have a male and a female occupying a territory. Sometimes if the prey density allows, you might have five or six animals uh, and they will all chip in to, to looking after the pups. They will help protect them. They will regurgitate food and bring that back to the, to the end site for them. Uh, so it, it's a collective effort. The wolves are under a, a huge amount of threat, sadly. Um, this area is increasingly um, being encroached on by grazers. And then perhaps the biggest challenge is the fact that the, the surrounding villages, um, the domestic dog population carry such diseases as rabies and distemper. So there's an ongoing program to, to vaccinate these wild uh, Ethiopian wolves and, and to keep on top of that. Uh, but it does mean that we see big fluctuations in the population. During our time in the Barley Mountains, we do meet up with one of the researchers from the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program. Uh, they take us out for the day and talk about the good work that they're undertaking. Uh, we, um, rightly so, 
um, provide quite a large donation for them for, for this time. Um, and we're, we're keen to support this project. They really are doing some super work. So just at the end of the talk, you will see that there's a little link um, for a, a website where you can make donations. And I don't often plug this, but the Ethiopian wolf conservation um, project, it, it is, it's a very good one. And, and these guys do need all the help that they can get. Um, but it's not just about the wolves when, you, when you're in the Bali Mountains, um, in the surrounding uh, hillsides and, and indeed the grasslands, it's not uncommon to see serval. There's an area called the Gaysa grasslands that we'll call in at, on the way to the Bali Mountains where we've seen serval on quite a few occasions previously. In the uh, stands of forest on the slopes uh, around the plateau, uh, you can find the um, mountain in Yala, uh, it's an endemic to Ethiopia. It was only described for the first time in 1910, um, and it was the last large antelope species in Ethiopia to be described. Also likely to see Menelux bushbuck. Uh, it's a very handsome, small antelope species, and this is a highland race that is specific to the Bali Mountains. Now, the Bali Mountains are incredible for birds um, as well. I think 17 of Ethiopia's 30 odd endemic or near endemic species are found in the Bali Mountains. We've got such species as the Rujets rail on the left here, blue winged goose, which is actually quite a, a common species throughout the highlands, uh, spot breasted lapwing, this is endemic to Ethiopia. The Bali Mountains is a, a really good place for this species. If you're lucky, you may see wattled cranes up on the plateau and even a few raptor species, particularly on the surrounding slopes where you've got a bit more forest cover. Uh, you can see Abyssinian long-eared owl, and indeed, it, with a bit of luck, Cape Eagle Owl. There's a, a stakeout that we call in uh, to try and see this species. Now, on the far side of the um, Seneti Plateau, on the southern boundary, you've got an area called the Harena Forest, um, and it's a, a stunning area. It's like a lost world, um, and it's one of Ethiopia's largest remaining tracts of forest, and it's here that uh, you can find the barley monkey, uh, a species, as the name suggests, which is uh, found exclusively in the barley mountains. And they feed almost entirely on bamboo. Um, they've only been recorded feeding on, I think it's 11 different species of plant, and about 80% of their diet is bamboo. So it does mean that they are very susceptible to extinction. Uh, you know, should any of these species die out or dwindle in, you know, in number, then it's going to have a huge knock-on effect for the barley monkeys. The lodge uh, in, in this area, the Barley Mountain uh, Lodge, is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, it was set up, I think, about five or six years ago by uh, Guy and Levine, and it is, it's the place to stay, really, if you're, um, if you're visiting the Barley Mountains. There's another option to stay in Goba, uh, which is on the other side of the plateau, but that's a government-run hotel. And I stayed there on, on my first visit, and I have to say it, it's not the best. So um, if you can try and get in at the lodge here, and it's just such a, a wonderful setting. The staff are brilliant, and there's some incredible wildlife just to be seen in the Herena Forest. They've encountered giant forest hogs, they've seen lions here, there's even records of wild dog occurring here, and they even have this crazy sighting of a melanistic leopard. So you never know what's going to turn up. I mean, this stuff is all very, very rare. You'd never visit the Herena Forest with the expectation of seeing these things, uh, but it is possible. And the nice thing is that you have the option of staying at a comfortable lodge and exploring the forest or going back up onto the plateau to look for the wolves. Now, on that note, I am going to wrap things up. I think I've been talking about 40 minutes. Uh, so it's probably about time, but just to summarize um, on, on what you can get from a trip to Ethiopia. Um, first and foremost, you're going to get stunning scenery, incredible wildlife and really welcoming people. Um, the accommodation is not fancy. Um, the private lodges that we use up in the Simeons and in the Bali Mountains are, are nice, they're comfortable, but some of the government run hotels are, are really quite simple. So, so don't travel with the expectation of any luxury. Um, and you need to appreciate that you're going to have to be flexible with your itinerary. Um, things do crop up and it is quite a challenging place to visit at times, uh, but it is absolutely fascinating if you give it a chance. Uh, the photographic opportunities are insane. It's one of the best places I've visited for photography. Um, and in, time to, well, in terms of when to visit, the season is, is really very clear. It, it's from October through till March. Uh, that's when you need to go. If you go outside of this time, then you have a high chance of encountering some heavy showers, which can make traveling quite difficult. We will usually travel around in an air-conditioned um, four-wheel drive uh, coaster bus. 
so it's very comfortable with lots of space and, and good windows for opening up for, for photography. Now, before I finish up, I will just mention these two books. Um, as we've seen, Ethiopia's got some incredible mammals, some incredible birds. Um, you're going to need some good field guides to back you up in the field. Um, birds of the Horn of Africa is my favourite bird guide for the region. Uh, that's been out quite a few years, but the book on the left here is The Mammals of Ethiopia. That's only came out, I think, at the end of last year. Um, it was written by a chap called Trevor Jenner, who's a, a fabulous guy. And the detail um, of the mammal descriptions and the distribution maps and so forth are absolutely brilliant. Um, well worth getting that if you're going to be visiting Ethiopia. Right, um, I guess I should wrap things up now. Uh, just a quick thank you to Eric Barnes, Ben Cherry, and of course my wife, Annie Cree, for providing images. But thank you for listening. Hopefully, we should have Nick around here somewhere. Hi, I am still here. Don't worry, don't worry, Dan. I, 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 yeah. I hadn't fallen asleep. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, thank you. Don't you just set your alarm, didn't you? That's it. <laughs> no, that, was, that was wonderful. Uh, that really was. And um, I have to say that I'm delighted that you managed to put some stuff in there that, uh, about Lalibela uh, uh, in, in particular. That photograph, that black and white photograph, is incredible. Cracker, isn't it? Amazing. Was that Ben who took that? It was, yeah, and, and Ben's really good at getting the guys, getting the group up there at the right time and getting this shot. It requires yeah. a bit of coordination with the monks there and stuff to get them to pose, but they're, they're usually yeah. pretty happy to do so. Um, absolutely superb. I mean, that's kind of, you know, Magnum style quality. It's absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Really, really fabulous. Oh, it's a lovely one. Yeah, yeah. No, as you said earlier, you could spend the whole evening talking about the cultural side, the historical side. Um, that is fascinating in itself, but... Alongside that, you have got some pretty cool wildlife as well. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. As 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 you very eloquently uh, um, explained there as well. And listen, look, we've got um, we, we we've got you know as, as always uh, a uh, a long list of questions. And I have to say, everybody, I'm really sorry. We're not going to be able to get through them all. Um, I'm, I'll say that now. So I'm going to I'm going to I've I've been busy in myself with. Uh, trying to put, put groups of questions together. Okay, so I'm gonna go from the top. Um, and uh, one of the first questions we got in um, uh, was uh, slightly concerned about temperatures. So obviously you, yes. you, you talked at the very start about the very um, varied temperatures that, that, that Ethiopia um, has. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're not going to be sending um, uh, our clients into the most extreme of, of, of temperatures. Um, so um, a question that has come in uh, from a number of people um, is when is the coolest time to uh, visit Ethiopia? Um, um, but it may be that um, it is best illustrated with, you know, what is the best time to go to Ethiopia? Because mm -hmm. we've obviously got group trips that travel there. We've mm -hmm. got group trips that go in in November uh, mm -hmm. later this year um, and obviously next November. And we've got a group trip that goes next February as well. Mm -hmm. That's obviously, um, you know, th those are obviously good times to go uh, mm -hmm. in November, in February. When um, you know, what, what kind of temperatures can um, can, can, can no. people ex um, expect? It's, it's really comfortable, Nick, at that time. Um, the, October is when the rains tend to dry up. And yeah. then you've got the dry season, which continues from October through till March, I would yeah. suggest. And it gets a little bit warmer through that period and slightly drier. Yeah. Um, so I always really like to go in, in November. Um, December can get quite busy. Um, and then January, February is, is equally a very good time to go, but slightly drier. Um, yeah. Temperatures up in the Simeons, you're, you're looking at around probably about 15 degrees during the middle of the day, something okay. like that, 20 yeah. degrees. So, so not, you know, it really quite pleasant actually for being out and about, but yeah. crucially that will drop down to freezing and, and below freezing overnight. So it takes a while to warm up, you know, sure. in the mornings. Um, down in the Rift Valley, probably around 30 degrees, I would expect during the middle of the day. And then when you get out to the Barley Mountains, um, again, it's similar to the Simmons, excuse me, probably around 10 degrees, 15 degrees in the middle of the day. Okay, but so, very cold overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. And then we've got we've we've got tailor made options as well, and obviously the tailor made options that that, that we offer, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, such as um, Ethiopian wildlife extravaganza. I think that, that that's one of our tailor made trips. That's right. That we do. Yes. So yeah, and 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 we suggest that that can be done throughout the whole year except for August. Um, and so you know, 
from you know September through until July is there a, is there an optimum time to do that particular trip that tailor made trip again is it November and February or, or would you would you say that's great for I I still think that the the optimum time is is really from um middle to late October through till March. Um, you can operate those tailor-made ones throughout the year because we use smaller vehicles, they're four by four vehicles, yep. and they're just a bit um, easier to get around in, in the event of, you know, some heavy rain and stuff and of, of the roads perhaps being yep. in a bit of, you know, poorer condition. You, you'd struggle in the larger coaster buses that we use for transporting the groups, but it's still possible. Um, yep. But for me, yeah, the optimum time is, is late October through till, till March. Very good. Excellent. OK. And then we've had, um, again, a, um, a couple of other questions um, just asking about the um, about the walking um, mm -hmm. within the trips. And obviously you're going into you know, beautiful areas to walk mm -hmm. as part of the uh, and part of the itineraries is to you know, get out of the vehicles and, you know, and, and walk around. Are, um, are, are, is, is the walking very strenuous? Um, is, 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 is it more of, you know, just just guided strolls. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right, Nick. You can you can make it as, as strenuous uh, as you want, really. But we will obviously look after uh, everybody in the group, and and the idea is, is for it to be as accessible uh, as possible, really. Um, and and you don't need to go off climbing up hills and so forth to see this wildlife. The idea is that we pull up, and then we only have to walk a short distance, a few hundred meters, maybe a kilometer at most, and over easy ground and and over decent paths. Um, certainly that the probably the most challenging terrain is up in the Simeon Mountains. Yeah. Um, but here, all you really want to do, to be quite honest, is spend time with the geladas and, and yeah. spend time with their old well, their ibex and we'll get you into position and then you sit there and you just chill out with them. And yeah. uh, it, it's just amazing. Um, so yeah, it, it's not a physically demanding trip. The, the only thing to note really is uh, the high altitude that you are up around 4,000 meters um and some people like to take medication to help them with that um so that may be you know worth considering if you're really worried about it you can always fly out ahead of the group um and have longer for example in Addis Ababa or longer in in Gonda uh just a few more days just to acclimatize but we don't usually have problems um the air yeah. is thin but because it's not too physically demanding it's it's not such an issue and, and we do build in a period of acclimatisation before he heading straight up to that kind of altitude anyway. We do, yeah. I mean, we um, even Addis itself is up over 2,000 metres. Yeah. So you, you, you're you acclimatising just, you know, during your time in Addis, if you go up to Lalibela, oh, it's not Lalibela, forgive me, up to Gonda, then you're up to around 2,500 metres, maybe 3,000 metres. So it gradually builds up. Yeah, great. OK. Um, and as, as is um, inevitable when you're showing the wonderful photographs that you have shown, we've, we've got several camera related questions coming in. OK, mm -hmm. um, nothing technical. Um, you'll be pleased to, to, I might to, need to phone a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but although uh, although I do, I do know that uh, one of the uh, photographers is probably just listening to you behind the door anyway, isn't, isn't she? <laughs> I've, no, she, I've banished her to uh, to another room. I don't okay, like her listening. Okay, yeah, enough, I get too embarrassed. Enough. Anyway, look, um, the, the, the questions will, will, will keep pretty, pretty broad, but um, um, they're, they're, they're more in relation to what kind of kit, camera kit, should be people be taking with them? What kind of lenses would be good to have um, yeah. for, for for you know either of the group tours? Well, I, I would suggest you can't go too far wrong with like a 100 to 400. Just the versatility of that is um, it, it's a super lens. For these types of situations uh, a wide angle is, is going to be brilliant up in the simians for just capturing that incredible scenery and, and perhaps having you know some of the geladas at the forefront yeah. and, and with that backdrop yeah. um and then other than that, that, that they're, they're the main lenses you need really um uh, perhaps like a, a 70 mil or something like that for when you're at lalibella and for capturing those images of the of the monks but certainly you know photography is not my forte it, it is very much danny's um yeah. and if people do have specific questions i will you know probably run that by ben ben cherry who, who leads the photographic trips yeah um, and, but, and and we do I was, I, was, I was about to say you know one of the trips that we lead that, that we offer to um uh, ethiopia it's called uh, a unique wonder and that is specifically a photographic trip it is led by ben who took that wonderful black and white photograph of the monk um, in, in lalabella um, at the start mm -hmm. of, of dan's presentation um, but it also goes up to the simian mountains it goes to gondar 
goes to La Libella, uh, as I mentioned, uh, and it also goes into the Barley Mountains as well. Yeah, it, it goes through the Rift Valley, uh, so a, a couple of nights there, and then onto the Barley Mountains. And we actually fly back from the Barley Mountains. It's worth mentioning that, that it's quite nice to drive down there because you can take in the Rift Valley Lakes, get yeah. to the Barley Mountains, do your time there, and then you can either fly back from Goba or you can drive back to Owasa and fly from there. So it cuts out a big chunk of that journey. Um, yeah. Sounds but, good. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah, so that's a good itinerary. You know, if, if you're interested in joining that particular trip, you know, the documentation we provide you with is, is very much, you know, geared towards the kind of photographic equipment that you'd be taking with you. We can put you in touch with Ben as well, and he'll give advice there specifically on that trip as well. But in general, the advice there from Dan is, is you know, there is nothing uh, out of the ordinary photograph uh, camera kit wise that you need for this wildlife trip, as opposed to any other wildlife trip for that mm -hmm. matter. I mean, it's worth saying as well, Nick, that some of the bridge cameras these days are absolutely fantastic. You know, the, the zoom functions on those and everything and the, uh, the various different settings for, um, you know, for wide angle and so forth. So, so those bridge cameras are also brilliant. And, and they're obviously they're a lot easier to cast around as well. So, yeah. you know, as, as long as you've got an interest in photography, it really doesn't matter what you travel with. And indeed, we actually have a lot of people traveling on that trip where one of the, the couples, you know, one of the individuals in the couples will, will be a very keen photographer and the other one won't be, but it's still a nice trip to, to, to join, even if you don't have that photographic interest, just purely because you, you're you getting to spend longer in, in the key areas, really, yeah. uh, you know, the, the main interests, the main areas of interest. Okay, so we, we, we had a question here fairly early on, um, and um, it, uh, it, it came in fairly early into your presentation, and I, I'm pretty confident that your presentation will have answered it, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask it nevertheless. And it's quite simply, and this isn't a loaded question, it's quite simply, is Ethiopia more of a birding destination than a mammal destination? It's a really good question. Um, traditionally, I think it was regarded as a, a, a birding destination. And I think, if I'm honest, it's because those the birders that used to visit were just a little bit more hardcore and, and a bit of ahead of the game um, in terms of visiting some of these places. And it's a, a place where you can go and get a huge number of species very easily. Uh, and many of them, as we've discussed, you know, that are unique to that country. So it's a way of getting your list up. But um, it's certainly not all about the birds. The birds are fantastic, but the mammals, as we've seen, are incredible. You know, how can you not love the geladas, yeah. the Ethiopian wolves, uh, weather ibex and stuff? And certainly I would suggest that um, our unique wonder trip, that is mammals, iconic birds, and a bit of history. We also do the longer trip, the Ethiopian endemic wildlife, uh, which is more bird focused. Um, and that one actually goes further south than where we looked at today. Uh, so it goes south from the Bali Mountains, down to Yabello and Nigeli, where there's some further endemics you can pick up. There's a bird called the Prince Rispoli's Turico, which is a stunner, um, the Streisman's bush crow and stuff. Uh, but that that is a more dedicated birding trip. Um, and the accommodation further south is, is a lot simpler than what you will have encountered with yeah. the locations that I've mentioned today. I think you're absolutely right with, 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 with that answer. I remember when I, um, about four or five years ago, um, I went to uh, Ghana uh, and um, I, I met um, uh, an American couple who were on a, on a four month trip. Uh, they spent two months in Ethiopia, pure birding, and then two months in Ghana, just pure birding there. And they were mm -hmm. saying that Ethiopia is, is this, you know, for, if, if you're into birds, if, if, if you're a very, very keen birder, it is a must. You, mm -hmm. you, it has a plethora of birds to be seen there and they raved about it. But um, it's this wonderful, de it's a destination that has a wonderful opportunity for um, the general naturalist as well. You don't have to be a birding specialist to, to, to get the very most out of it. As you said, it's got the cultural heritage, it's got mammals as well, and some really wonderful, you know, unique endemic species as well. Um, so it's, and it's got the incredible scenery as well. I mean, that's, you know, the Simeon Mountains. I mean, I'm fascinated to go there. Oh, it's stunning, Nick. It, it, the, the photos don't do it justice, sadly, but the, the experience of being up there and you just look out and you, you just, yeah, it's breathtaking. Yeah, that's great. Even your dog agrees. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> She's been waiting all night for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, so listen, ladies and gents, um, there, there's loads more questions come in, okay? And I just want to take my eye off the screen 
just have a scroll through those to make sure that there's any, that, that I've got, got all of the good ones in, if, if, if I may. While I do that, um, everybody, what I'm going to do, I'm going to launch what's called a poll. Uh, and so on your screen in a moment or two is going to appear a question. And quite simply, we're, we've, we have three travel plans that we can send to you. Um, um, two of them are for group tours. So that's the Ethiopian uh, Unique Wonder and the Endemic Wildlife Group Tour. So those are traveling in the months of November and February. And then we have uh, the Ethiopian Wildlife Extravaganza, which is a tailor-made trip. Um, I should also say that the Unique Wonder Group Tour, that's the Ben Cherry um, trip, isn't it, Dan? That's the first It is, yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah. So Dan, um, just while I look away from the screen and just check the chat forum for any more questions, mm -hmm. can you just repeat, you know, just a, a quick blast through the locations and what the purpose yeah. of, of those three itineraries are? Yeah, and certainly. Sure we've got any last questions asked and then we can wrap up. Is that OK? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. So I'd say that the unique wonder trip, that's a 15 day trip. Um, that's our most popular group trip. Uh, it does have the photography focus, uh, but it is it's good for anybody with with with, uh, with a keen interest in visiting Ethiopia. Uh, it goes to the Simeons, it goes to Lalibela, it goes to the Rift Valley, and then it finishes up in the Bali Mountains. Um, so it's got those key sites in there. Uh, the Ethiopian Endemic Wildlife, um, that is more bird focused, um, and it doesn't go up to the Simeons. It kicks off in Addis, and then you go up to a place called Debra Labanos, uh, which is just to the north of Addis, uh, for some of the highland species there. We then come south and we go back out to Awash uh, National Park and then come back, go down through the Rift Valley and then out to the Bali Mountains and then continued south to Yabello and Nageli uh, before coming back up through the Rift Valley. So that's a 17 day trip and, and that is a birding trip. You know, um, we've operated that a few times and the species list is incredible at the end of that. You'll be looking at around 450 species of birds if you go on that, as well as all the mammals which we've featured tonight. Um, there's a very good tour report online, actually, if you did want to have a bit more information there. Now, the Ethiopian Wildlife Extravaganza, that is a trip idea, so that's a, a tailor-made option. And that's really, if I'm honest, that's a, it's only a 12-day trip, and, and that's probably the, the bare minimum uh, that you could spend in Ethiopia. It includes Lalibela, it includes the Simians, includes the Bali Mountains, but it's only a few nights in each. So if you're pushed for time or budget, then that's a, uh, an option for you. But it's really a starting point um, just to give you an idea. And I would strongly recommend that if you do have the budget and the time that you increase um, your stay at some of those locations. It's just to kind of set out the, the potential for an itinerary, um, which can be, yeah, tweaked as you require. But we can offer all of these trips on a tailor-made basis, Nick, as you well know, um, and we can put together whatever you want. If you tell us what your, your interests are, um, then we can make it happen. Yeah, and, and, and our website page on, on Ethiopia has got some great information about uh, these locations and a few others that we haven't mentioned as well. So, so do have a look at the um, page on our website. And if, and if um, you know, the itineraries aren't exactly what you would like to do, then, you know, well, Wildlife Worldwide started as, as, as a pure tailor-made um, company. That's what our, you know, uh, our beginnings are were and um, that's certainly what we um, pride ourselves on being able to do mm -hmm. as well. We've got a great team of travel consultants, wildlife consultants who can, of course, sell group tours, but, you know, can easily put together uh, very good quality tailor-made trips mm -hmm. as well and steer you with their own personal, you know, first-hand experience as well. So, mm -hmm. and, and the group trips you can do, obviously, pre-tour and post-tour extensions and stuff as well. So, yeah. for example, Unique Wonder doesn't include Awash National Park. If you wanted to go there, then we can just tag that on at the end. It's very easy to do. Very good. So, Dan, there's three or four questions that I'm going to just just wrap up with by the way um loads of praise for your presentation <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so well you. done there and also it seems that you have struck a chord with many people who have been to Ethiopia already and brought back some some really lovely memories uh, for them as well so so, so, so thanks for that um there, there again a, a question which uh, I think has been answered um by your presentation but also in the subsequent question and answers with regards to including cultural aspects of Ethiopia, you know, can we include those? A absolutely right. As you saw, Lalibela, Aksum, you know, very important places, the um, fortified churches uh, around Gondar as well. You know, I think it's um, 
uh, very, very important to include um, those within an Ethiopian itinerary because it's so important to the country, isn't it? It's part of its heritage. It's, you know, it's, it's um, uh, um, part of what makes Ethiopia Ethiopia, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And Peter Ormond in particular traveled with us um, and uh, he, he, he's very proud that he also got a, 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 a photograph of the priest in uh, Lalabella, similar to that we showed there of, of um, Ben Cherry. So um, he, he, he's delighted to have been um, uh, uh, reminded of that. So I'm sure he'll be Pete, looking Pete, at that photograph. Peter again. did a pre-tour extension and went up to the Simeons um, oh, for about four or five days prior and did an extensive kind of trekking route around there. So that's also quite a nice thing to do. Uh, he's a, yeah. a very keen walker. So yeah. it's, it's I mean, the trekking nice options in Ethiopia are amazing and, and um, Walks Worldwide, which is our walking brand, um, they, the, the, the sister brand of Wildlife Worldwide offers Ethiopia and in particular the Simeon Mountains as well. It's um, mm -hmm. a great place if you're a keen, keen trekker. And easy to, as you say, easy to arrange as part of a wildlife trip. Yep. before or after group tour but just on group tours a question um from from, from one of um our um uh, attendees is regarding the the size of the group how many guests um, should she expect on uh, either either of those group tours it's usually um between six and ten i would suggest um it really depends on the the nature of the the habitat and the terrain that we're going into obviously if we're going into a forested in, environment then the group size is likely to be smaller if we're out in the opium up, up in the simians for example in the barley mountains then it is much easier to have a slightly larger group um, but they'll always be escorted by um, a, a uk leader uh, and then a local leader as well a local expert and then you'll have a driver on top of that as well um, so the, the ratio of leaders to, to guests is usually very good. Yeah, I mean the key thing is uh, that we, we're not we're not doing coach loads um, of of, of um, members of groups. What what the way that we tend to describe our group tours is usually small group sizes, and as to, as Dan said, it's usually up to ten people. Um, yeah. Occasionally like eleven or twelve, I think, on some yeah. of them as well. But you know, it, it works. We we know what works in terms yeah. of group sizes. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to squeeze people in. And um, road journeys, and should should um, people be prepared for very long road journeys? I mean, you mentioned flying back from Awash, was it, on one of the trips, just to um, from just, Awasa, uh, yeah, yeah, Awasa. Apologies, just to kind of you know um, uh, lessen the road travel. Should people be expecting very long road journeys, or are there are there short shortcuts that we can um, uh, that, that we've been able to build into the itineraries? No, that's a really good question. Um, the the I think the longest road journey is um, is about half a day. On occasions in the past where flights haven't worked, we've had to do a full day drive to get from A to B. Um, but there is uh, an increasing number of flights available. So we, we are trying to reduce those long days. Um, uh, I think in the past, it was at the end of the trip, we had to get back to the Bali mountain, uh, get back from the Bali mountains back to Addis, and that would be a, a full day journey, uh, but you'll usually break it up with a night or two uh, in the Rift Valley en route. Uh, but there are options to fly and stuff, so you can minimize the, the road journeys. Um, the, the Chinese um, are out there and have put in lots of new roads and stuff. Uh, so the roads are, are actually a, a lot better than what they used to be uh, and a lot easier to travel over. Um, but you, you're going to have, yeah, s some reasonable uh, journeys, I would imagine. At the very least, you're going to have a probably a three or four hour uh, journey from um, Gonda up to the Simeon Mountains and up to the lodge up there. Uh, but it, it's all part of the experience because the yeah, landscape okay, is just yeah. stunning. And, the you know, the, 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 the people and the, the birds and stuff on route are, are just fabulous as well. Uh, so you'll stop frequently, um, you know, for refreshment stops and, and loo breaks and so forth. So... I think you just have to realise that it's, it's going to be part of the trip in, in, you know, in some instances. This is not a place to visit if you're looking for two or three weeks just to kick back and relax, you know. Um, it, 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 uh, it, it's a bit more than that, you know. It's a bit more of an experience, I would suggest. Yeah, yeah. And I think the experience of driving through a country like Ethiopia, and I'm sorry to bring Namibia into this, but it's the same kind of thing, you know, that they're... they're it is it is easy to build in you know enormously long road journeys but you don't want to do that so what you want to do is break those long journeys up into shorter journeys and that whilst they may be you know three or four hours long or, or maybe even half a day long 
the scenery that you're passing through is so spectacular um, and it, it is part of the experience as Dan says uh, and there's always something to photograph as you're traveling through uh, and there's always rest stops as well aren't there and there's always mm -hmm. you know enough yeah. time to pause and enjoy the country that you're driving through. Yeah, absolutely. We do use good vehicles. We will either use these four wheel drive coaster buses or we will use actual four wheel drive and just put, I think we put a maximum of three clients in a, in a, um, a four wheel drive, so two in the back and, and one in the front. So yeah. it's a good amount of space. Well, listen, Dan, um, uh, thank you so much for that. Ladies and gents, I'm going to end the poll there. Sorry, I forgot to do that earlier. So I'm going to end that. So um, for those of you who have requested a travel plan for uh, those trips to be sent to you, um, you can expect to get those in the next couple of days. OK, and, and we'll be sending those to you by email, obviously. Uh, and, um, and, and Dan, for you, um, great praise from, from all of the um, attendees that we've had here. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for that presentation. It's only whetted my appetite even further to go to the country myself. And um, yeah, I, I, I can't wait for that. Um, while uh, you're, you're all still with us, um, our next evening presentation is going to be on Thursday evening. And we're going to be talking about Nagahole in India. Uh, and um, uh, I do hope that you can join us for that. You just need to go to our website and sign on um, for that presentation through the events page on our website. OK, um, if Ethiopia is something that you would like to um, uh, book with us, then do remember, please, to use our discount code. Uh, and that's ETHI21, and that is £100 per person off your booking with us. So you just need to quote that to us when you are ready to book your holiday. And if you want to talk to us about Ethiopia or any other destinations that we offer, then do telephone us on the telephone number in front of you or send us an email. Um, but in the meantime, um, have a look at our website. If you haven't got a brochure, and I'm sure you have, but if you haven't, you can order that through our website. Uh, and for now, I'd like to thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Dan, thank you again. Uh, and to all of you, uh, continue please to stay safe. Uh, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much yeah. and good night. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.